الحمد للہ رب العالمین وصلاۃ وسلام علی سید المرسلین اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الصلاۃ والسلام علیک یا رسول اللہ صلاۃ والسلام علیک یا رسول اللہ وعلى آلك واصحابك يا حبيب الله وعلى آلك واصحابك يا حبيب الله صلاۃ والسلام علیک یا نبی اللہ وعلى آلك واصحابك يا نور الله Booklet Blessings of Salat and Salam, page number 2, saying of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, number 3. He who recites Salat upon me once, Allah Almighty, sends 10 mercies upon him and writes 10 good deeds in his book of deeds. Sallu ala al-Habib, sallallahu ala Muhammad. I've got one question. We have got a business and you know sometimes businesses they have ups and downs. What actually happens is certain people approach us they come to our shop they offer us to borrow money from them maybe two or three hundred thousand rupees and they do this to help us and those lenders are participants of a committee system in south asia to save money which is also known as bc and they ask us to pay installment of their bc or committee on their behalf daily say one thousand rupees they do not become partner in our business they just do this to help us this way but in return they ask us to pay installment of their bc or committee every month on their behalf furthermore the committee system has its length when it finishes its length or say for example if we have paid all the amount we had borrowed from them in this case they start paying future installments or that committee or bc ends I mean that whatever money we have borrowed from them, that amount does not decrease. Whereas additional 1,000 rupees we have to pay on their behalf every day. Unless or until we do not pay back full loan of 300,000 rupees which we borrowed from them, we keep on paying 1,000 rupees on their behalf as part of installment of their BC or committee. Please guide us as if this borrowing is permissible or not. Jazakallah. May Allah Almighty bless you, your parents. me my parents and all of us with forgiveness without any accountability the question that you have asked it is a form of interest and it is haram interest is extremely evil on the day of judgment the person who deals in interest will be afflicted with a severe headache just Imagine how awful we feel when we get a headache in this world how anxious we become so this worldly headache is nothing only allah knows what kind of headache that would be which a consumer of interest will be afflicted with may allah almighty save us from it interest is not good it is extremely evil haram and something leading to the hellfire the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam also saw the interest consumers in this state that The stomachs of some people were filled with snakes and scorpions and those stomachs of theirs were transparent like a bottle it was clearly visible through their stomachs and if that is the case then of course they'll also harm a person so they were in an extremely painful state and condition the prophet ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam was told that they used to deal in interest and an interest based system has embedded deeply into our society nowadays perhaps seldom live would anyone be saved of interest today and nowadays interest is called profit interest is interest it is such a profit that is the leader of all the losses that's the reality of this profit it is fard to repent from it sincerely and wholeheartedly No matter what we have to refrain from it whatever amount of interest one has consumed up to now na'udhu billah 
Don't think that after repenting, all that money is fine now. It doesn't get purified. Have you ever seen a coal to turn out to be white after being repeatedly washed? It doesn't. Similarly, if someone washes excrement, even the last particle of it will remain impure. It doesn't get purified. The ruling regarding interest is that there are two options. One is that he from whom interest is taken return it back to him. Paid back. It's not our own. It has to be returned back. Or the second option is to give it to a Muslim who is a Shari'i Faqir, he who is eligible to receive zakah. So it should be given to such kind of any person. But not with the intention of gaining reward. And then repent as well. This is its solution. Some people think that it can be used in the bathroom of the masjid. It can't. It can't be used for any work. The only two options I told you about, one out of them, you have to choose. That will have to be acted upon. Some women say that uh, we should not count money at night. This removes blessings. And one should count the money in the morning. Due to it, blessings descend. How true is this concept? Please guide us in this regard. I've come across this first time. There's nothing as such. You may count it during the night or during the day. Now if you need to purchase something at night time, now are you going to pay him with a fistful of money without counting? If there is less money, then he'll come after you, remember? And if it is more, then he perhaps wouldn't. Of course you'll have to count. If you want to pay your fitra amount at night time, it's permissible to do so. People do pay their fitra during the Nasser Ramadan. Now of course they'll do so by counting the fitra amount. One will take the cash out after counting it. People out there just keep spreading nonsensical rumors and baseless notions that have nothing to do with reality. This should be avoided. Just pay attention to what the scholars say. And in regards to whatever the public comes up with, always double check with the scholars whether it is true or not. Sallu ala al-habib, sallallahu ala muhammad. I've got one question. Customers, they come and buy suits or sherwanis from us. After buying, they use them. And after using those clothes, they come back and they want to return them. Now, we can see clear signs that product was used. Customers become stubborn. and They insist us to accept returns. What is Islamic ruling in this regard? Please guide. When are those stain marks from? Are they from the beforehand which you didn't inform them of and sold them the same product with stain marks on it? If this is the case, then in this scenario, it is your fault. Well, then in this case, when the transaction was completed and there was no such fault in the product at that time, which would be deemed as such a fault which the seller deliberately hid from the customer before selling it. And the product was non-faulty and in an excellent condition. And it was decided at that time that you can check it now, but I will not refund it afterwards. And now he comes with a complaint of stains. Now it is not your responsibility to take it back. If you do take it back and refund it, then it will be your favor on him. But otherwise, there is no blame on you. Sallu ala al-Habib, sallallahu ala Muhammad. My question is that people send us different prayers and images of the blessed green dome on our mobile phones. So what then happens is that when the mobile memory fills up, we end up deleting them. So how is it to delete them? Please shed some light on this issue. Please pray for me, my wife, my children and my entire household. Jazakallahu khair. MashaAllah, what a beautiful, respectful mindset this is. You have that fear and concern in your heart that how would I delete it? Anyhow, according to Sharia, it is permissible. However, having this sense of realization and concern in your heart is also a privilege. As it is a proof of having love for Allah Almighty and His Messenger. A person thinks, how would I delete this? And now, there's one more problem in deleting it. In our mobile phones, the image that they have made for the delete option is of the dustbin. The image for the delete option is of a trash bin. And it shows as if it gets dumped into it. Now this is how it's been formulated. So this is another point of concern or issue you can say in this. In deleting it. The heart doesn't feel at peace by deleting it in this manner. Deleting the blessed name of Allah Almighty or His Messenger or the blessed image of the Kaaba or the Green Dome or any sacred writing. Now what can we do? There's no other option besides this. It becomes very difficult for a person when his phone memory fills up. 
Now mobile phone is a necessity nowadays. However, according to Sharia, it is permissible. It's not a sin. Nevertheless, respectful one is fortunate. Subhanallah. I really like your mindset. May Allah Almighty bless you immensely. His grace is upon you. Now we should also adorn our faces with the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. As you can imagine where the shaved hair would fall. The full beard should be kept and we should also offer the daily prayers punctually. Spending our lives according to Sharia and also repent for shaving the beard up to now. MashaAllah, you've got a very respectful mindset. Congratulations to you. Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ala Muhammad. I want to ask from Amir of Ahl Sunnah that if any pet animal dies, what should we do with its dead body? Generally, what normally happens is that people dispose of the body of the dead animal safely here and there. Now, of course, there wouldn't be a shrine built for it, would it? And it's not imperative to bury them either. As in, we don't have to bury them as we normally bury a Muslim with respect and reverence. Just dispose it with consideration. Nonetheless, there have been some sacred animals in the past that people did bury. And there's no harm in this practice as it has been stated in the books that once there was a camel running in Makkatul Mukarrama. People tried to capture it but they couldn't. And that camel entered Masjidul Haram. Now, it headed forward and reached right in front of the blessed Kaaba. And then it went around it seven times and people were watching everything. It performed the tawaf of the Kaaba and then sat in front of Hazrat Aswad facing it. Now after this, that camel started shedding tears from his eyes, tilting to one side, and then it passed away. Now the people present there were really impressed with that camel. People picked it up very respectfully and where Sa'i is performed between Safa and Marwa, they buried that camel right over there. This account is very old. Nowadays it is not possible. Nowadays camels are not even seen in Mecca. I have never seen one. Nowadays, animals like camels, horses, mules, etc. are not seen in Makkah al-Mukarrama. The population has increased and the number of Hajj offering people has also increased. And the reason for this could also be that in case of them going out of control, it can cause severe damage. So this is a separate matter. Similarly, someone told me in India that next to this shrine, there is a parrot buried and that parrot would also have some kind of speciality. So if someone has done something like this based on its importance or a specific need then what Sharia ruling can we impose on him? Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ala Muhammad Once upon a time we were raising funds for a masjid. In that fundraising event many personalities, businessmen, they were present. I was encouraging them to donate in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after that, we had a question and answer session too. One of those participants asked one question. He said, Imran, why do you do shara'i khila on zakabani and then use that to build a masjid? I said, you give us clear funds, we'll use that. Because you're the one who asked quietly about khila, if zakabani will be accepted. These questions are asked from your end. So better you give us money which is not zakah money, clear funds. That will make our life easy. Our time will be saved and we will not be going through all the prescribed procedures by Islamic law for doing shari hila. We will use that money to construct masjid and that will be much better and easy. That's how I responded. Unfortunately, this is due to lack of knowledge. People come up with things like, we don't understand this concept of hila. They clearly say this. They're just naive people, the common public. Al-Awamu Kal An'am Those whom Allah Almighty blesses with the company of the scholars. They understand these rulings. The books of fiqh have separate chapters on this subject like Kitab al hiyal Chapter of Hilas. It is proven from the Quran. Sayyidatuna Rahmat Rahmatullahi alayha Who was the blessed wife of Sayyiduna Ayyub Ala Nabiyyina wa alayhi salatu wassalam She Rahmatullahi alayha would serve him greatly but at one occasion Sayyiduna Ayyub salam said to her that I would whip you hundred lashes. She rahmatullahi alayha was very obedient and loyal to him. Now as he salam said this, he also took an oath upon it. What to do now? So Allah Almighty then told him about a Ahila. Yes, it is mentioned in the Holy Quran and we'll also mention that verse to you. 
وخذ بيدك ضغفا فاضرب به ولا تحنف take a broom in your hand and strike her with it in brackets since you took oath to strike your wife with hundred lashes yes right a broom of hundred throws mashallah strike her with a broom of hundred throws and don't break your oath this will fulfill your oath subhanallah so to understand it further you see the normal straws that you would normally come across it was stated that take those straws hundred of them and make a broom out of it and strike your wife with that broom once and this will be deemed as 100 now if this isn't hila then what else is hila so the quran is teaching us about the hila hila is mentioned in hadith like i just mentioned you about sadaqah and only he will deny about this who is distant from islamic knowledge and the scholars of islam a possessor of knowledge will never deny it nor will those who sit in the company of the scholars but the scholars should be such who are practicing and those who teach the rulings of Sharia. These are the scholars I'm referring to, the truthful scholars of Islam. Those are the devotees of the Prophet, the scholars of the Ahlul Sunnah. So these kinds of rulings are every now and then and quite frequently mentioned in their gatherings. So those who stay in their company, they know about these rulings, they have no problem with it. There's no reason whatsoever for a person to have any kind of whispers regarding Hila. Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ala Muhammad. Beloved Shaykh, you mentioned in the Madni Muzakara that calamities befall by wearing black shoes. Black shoes are included in our school uniform. Would calamities befall us as well? When did I say that calamities befall? Now you see, this is the result of not listening to the Madni Muzakara with full concentration. Someone perhaps asked this kind of question, and in reply I forbade it, that calamities do not befall. You reminded me of the old days. Someone said to me that, you have said that Salah will not be valid if a person looks in the mirror or that it becomes makruh tahrimi something like this. It's a very old account. So I asked him if he said this to anyone else and he said, yes, I have. I said to him, when did I say this? My reply perhaps would have been that Salah is valid if offered in front of a mirror. If there's a mirror in front of the person offering Salah, there's no problem in it and there's no element of dislike in it either. If someone's concentration deviates because of the mirror being in front of him, then he may remove it. Like many a times, glass work is done on the walls of the masajid and you can see your own reflection in it. So if it hinders your concentration, then avoid it. It is a better approach. So anyways, confusions do occur. I didn't say that. I have just mentioned what I said. And I've been saying this from a very long time. What the scholars have written. The surrun nazirin, Meaning, that what is attractive, what pleases to the eyes. It is stated in the Quran. Under it, it says that yellow shoes that brings about happiness and it removes sorrow and by wearing black shoes sorrows increase this is mentioned in the commentary of the quran ruhul ma'ani wearing black shoes is permissible however the pious predecessors state that it creates sorrow therefore it should be avoided and wearing yellow shoes lessens sorrows allama alusi rahimahullah mentions in tafsir ruhul ma'ani That Sayyidina Ali Karramallahu Wajahul Kareem would give encouragement to wear yellow shoes and would say that he who wears yellow shoes, his sorrows will reduce. Sayyidina Ibn Zubair and Sayyidina Yahya bin Kathir radiallahu anhuma used to forbid from wearing black colored shoes, saying that it creates sorrow. Tafsir Ruhul Ma'ani Under the commentary of Surah Baqarah Chapter 2 and verse number 69 But I did not say that calamities befall Allah knows the best if I uttered it It could have been a slip of tongue when a person intends to say something else but ends up saying something else So I do apologize But if I would have said something like that then our scholars do supervise us there are many scholars who are very close to me, who do, alhamdulillah, guide and correct me, in case I make a mistake. Sallu ala al-Habib, sallallahu ala Muhammad. It is said, when Quran is there, and what is the need of hadith? Everyone knows and understands that salah is fard, and its command has also been given in the Quran at many places. Aqeemu salah establish the prayer. And now let's say we don't need hadith. Then how would you offer Salah? Tell me that. 
The method of salah is mentioned in a hadith. As in how many units of prayers to be offered in Zohar Salah, Maghrib Salah, Isha Salah, etc. All these instructions are mentioned in a hadith. So what will you do now? How to pay zakah and who can zakah be paid to? The very sensitive rulings of fasting, such as what invalidates it, what doesn't, etc. will be found in a hadith. Moreover, Allah Almighty commanded in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Certainly in the Messenger of Allah you have an exceptional example. So just by reading this verse, are we going to start acting upon all the sunnahs? Obviously we learn from a hadith that how were the days and nights of the Prophet ﷺ spent and how did he talk, drink, eat, go to sleep, walk, meet the people, all these sunnahs. We learn from hadith. So therefore we cannot ignore the hadith. Otherwise, thousands of commentaries of the Qur'an will go to waste because didn't those commentators of the Qur'an know that there's no need for hadith? So many hadith scholars came. They wrote voluminous hadith books. They collected hundreds of thousands of hadith. And none of them knew anything. As in now the Qur'an has been revealed, let's just act upon it. How would you do it? Without hadith. We can't even take a single step forward without hadith. So this is a satanic whisper that at times people fall prey to. So may Allah give us the ability to understand what has been said. And let me clarify another thing that not all of us can understand hadith ourselves. Trying to understand ourselves without having the adequate knowledge will make us stumble over it. We are dependent upon scholars for this. Even in paradise we'll be dependent upon them. Yes, that's right, even in paradise. If someone claims that he can reach his destination without the scholars, then although he'll be heading towards his destination, but that will be towards the hellfire, not towards paradise. The scholars will show the way towards paradise. We can't get there on our own. I'm saying it clearly. Even in paradise, we'll be in need of the scholars. This has been mentioned in hadith that Allah Almighty will say that ask what you want to ask. Then the people will ask the scholars that tell us what should we ask for. Then the scholars will guide them that ask for this, ask for that. Study the hadith. We are in need of hadith as well as fiqh, as well as Quranic commentaries. And we are also in need of the commentaries of hadith and also the scholars. Without the scholars, we can't even take a single step. Those who keep criticizing and keep talking ill of the scholars upon every matter, they truly are heading towards the hellfire. They should avoid that path and return from there. Nevertheless, if you did get hurt because of any unpracticing scholar, it doesn't mean that all the scholars are wrong. All the prophets were scholars. You keep talking of all the scholars. Was there any prophet who wasn't a scholar? And remember this too, that every prophet is the biggest scholar of his ummah. And the Holy Prophet وسلم, is the leader of all prophets. So he's the biggest scholar. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the biggest scholar amongst the entire creation. Worship does have importance. But being a worshipper, a devout worshipper, is not an attribute of Allah Almighty. The attribute of Allah Almighty is being alim. Allah is alim. Not abid. Abid meaning a worshipper. So you can see that talking ill of the scholars, the ulama, where does it lead to? Now all the awliya of Allah they all are scholars. An ignorant person cannot be a wali of Allah. You will find the narrations of scholars in this regard. He who doesn't know how to offer salah himself, he who is unaware of shari matters himself, how would he become a wali? So only a scholar becomes a wali. This is an absolute definitive fact that I'm mentioning. And those ignorant people who are far away from sharia ah, whom people deem to have reached a certain station have indeed reached a station, but not of Allah's proximity, rather of Satan the accursed. We should avoid such people. Staying in the servitude of the scholars will make you gain paradise. And that would be via Medina, inshallah. You have replied beautifully. I hope that this reply will help the ummah. Ummah will benefit from it, inshallah. If you regularly watch the Madini Muzakira, then I believe that the thousands of whispers that we fall prey to will inshallah get uprooted. Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ala Muhammad. In order to enter in the fold of Islam, is it enough to recite kalima, the statement of faith from tongue alone? Testifying from the heart is must. Otherwise, you will find many disbelievers who would have even memorized many parts of the Quran. It is common for them to know the kalima. 
Those non-Muslims who socialize with Muslims do say things like Assalamu alaikum, Jazakallah, etc. They utter all this, but they're non-Muslims. Once I was in the overseas and a person came to me and met me really warmly and said Assalamu alaikum to me. And when he left, one of the local brothers who knew him told me that he was a non-Muslim. Now what to do about this? Locals know them, so it's all about the testification of the heart. No matter if someone recites the kalima his entire life, but his heart is not testifying to the fact that only Allah is worthy of worship and Muhammad is his messenger, then he will of course not be included within the folds of Islam. Iqrarun bil lisani wa tasdiqun bil qalb Acknowledge with the tongue and testify from the heart. Believe from the heart as well. Sallu ala al-habib sallallahu ala muhammad In tashahud, when we raise our index finger, please mention its Islamic ruling as well as mention its proper method. Jazakallah. It is sunnah to raise finger in tashahud, right? So how it is done is, up to ashhadu wal, the fingers will stay in normal position like this. And upon uttering la, it will be raised like this. The small finger and the finger next to it will be joined with the palm. And the middle finger and the thumb will join together to form a circle. And you will learn this through practicing and the finger shouldn't be bent like this, rather straight. Don't do like this either, some people do so and some do like this. However, the correct method mentioned in Bahari Sharia is that the little finger and the finger next to it, they join together to the palm and a circle is formed with the middle finger and the thumb and the index finger is absolutely straight. For example, right now it is in normal state. Now, Ashhadu wal la ilaha illallah. So we will raise it upon a tring la and put it down upon a tring illa. So this is the right method. You won't get used to it without practicing it. You won't learn it just by listening. You will practice it once, then you will forget it again, and then continuous practice will take you there. If you travel in Madani Qafilas, then inshallah you'll get used to it. Do the seven days salakos. MashaAllah, so many brothers have come. So after three days, since all of you have come from far and wide, from the Multan region, Rahim Yar Khan, and many other villages and cities from Pakistan and abroad, if you all get ready to do this course, then as soon as these three days of yours get over, then from the fourth day, the course will start for seven days in Fezani Medina. It will be Medina Medina. So do the blessings of Salah course. There are various other courses as well. But through this, you'll inshallah also learn how to raise your finger in Salah with the will of Allah. You will also learn many other rulings of Salah in the Blessings of Salah course. So gather courage and present your name for the seven day blessings of Salah course. Go at Darusunnah stall. As many classes are formed depending on how many of you are in total, inshallah the required amount of teachers will also be provided to you. And they will inshallah teach you this course. All these courses are running throughout the year, alhamdulillah. But bear in mind that we will neither give you money nor any job. If it comes to getting a job, then people get ready to do a course for two years. And they give in more years if it's about going abroad. And just a seven day course that leads you towards paradise. We hardly give time for it. Out of compulsion. Take time out. I do understand their job issues and their business issues, etc. But however, gather some courage. And those who don't have time should take out time later. And these courses are held in Multan as well, even in many other cities. So try to find out where is it being run near you. In fact, I would suggest you to do it in another city than your own city. If you do it in your own city, you might go home then. Someone may ring you, saying that so and so has fallen ill, we need this, we need that. So I've given you a tip of wisdom. In your own city, you'll keep wanting to go home. Your family members will keep calling you. So perhaps you won't be able to complete the course. So the blessings of Salah course will prevail everywhere, showering its blessings and it will enliven the Masajid further. When the Salah of people will be corrected, it will also eradicate evil from its root. Inshallah Azza wa Jal. Sallu ala al-Habib. 
صلی اللہ علیہ محمد مدنی مذاکر مدنی مذاکرہ